All right, we're going to start this morning, and we're going to continue to build on the Vince Lombardi-like fundamentals of good parenting, and then we'll start getting into some, some deeper stuff. Um, can anybody, everybody see these two kids here? That's, that's my DNA right there. Okay. Those are two of my, two of my, my three-and-a-half grandkids. Um, Right out of the womb, uh, with these kids uh, tainted by uh, the culture uh, to make them evil, or were they, were they born evil? Raise your hand if, if, if you think that uh, they're born innocent and the, and the culture just makes them evil. Good for you. That's, what, that's, that's, the, that's the answer. Evil, right there. Okay? That's the devil incarnate. I go to churches, and 50% of the people say, oh, no, you know, those, those kids are innocent. And, and that's, see, that's part of the whole worldview problem that the church has. And so today we're going to talk about worldview uh, in, this, in this session. And you're going to see how it applies to everything else we're going to talk about for the remainder of, the, of the, uh, our time together. Um, we touched on common sense a little bit yesterday, last night. Uh, but uh, have we really stopped to think what common sense really is? Uh, what is common sense? Anyone want to tell me what common sense is? If it's so common? Well, <clears throat> in order to have common sense, there has to be a common standard by which we can go back and refer back to. What is common sense when it comes to parenting? Well, if common sense for life or for parenting is to be truly common, that means, again, we have to have a common standard. So who or what should be that standard? We're, back, right, we're right back here again, which you guys knew the answer to that. And for the first 200 years of American history, common sense, for the most part, has always come through the lens of a biblical worldview. Until the 1960s, when we got smarter than God, and uh, we, postmodern thought, post a postmodern worldview began to take over. And from the 60s uh, to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, now, broom, we just bought it hook, line, and sinker, and it's crept into a lot of our churches, which is why uh, they think we, who still adhere to this, are a cult. You know, we're a cult. And they didn't, a lot of them don't even know what cult is. They, they, yeah, if someone calls you a cult, say, do you even know what a cult is? Tell me what a cult is. And they'll probably say, well, it's uh, Satan worship and all that, because the occult isn't cult, okay? Whole other story, I didn't mean to go there, sorry. No extra charge. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, uh, but I probably uh, lived more Christian in my heathen home than most Christian homes do today, simply because the culture had influenced uh, my family and our neighborhood and our entire society to, to live that way. We had a common sense way of doing things, which originated from this, just like the Constitution did. Our whole nation, uh, generally speaking, bought into a Judeo-Christian moral ethic for living life and raising kids. And right here is the crux of all of our problems, folks. In our private lives, in our church lives, in our nation, and when I say our, I mean the church at large, okay? So please, I'm talking generalities. You plug it in where it needs to be plugged in or let it roll off your back like water in a duck. And certainly when it comes to parenting our kids. And you're probably asking, well, what does worldview have to do with parenting my kid? And I'm here to tell you it has everything to do with parenting your kid, everything. And we're going to talk about that. But for those of you who might be asking, what's a worldview? Uh, it's the lens by which we filter truth, life, and all of reality. We all have these presuppositions. And throughout all of, accumulated, uh, all of our accumulated knowledge in life, a worldview is created by and helps create all the presuppositions that we have about things like religion, relationships, morality, people groups, and how we parent our kids. So, Again, where should our worldview come from? Back to Romans 12, 2, right? Worldview should, should, has to start somewhere. It could start with some doctor or some therapist or some witch doctor. It's got to start somewhere. Why not something that history has substantiated as being uh, very authoritative? Um, 
God has always uh, had a way, or he always has his way of looking at reality in all situations. He has a worldview too, including how we should parent our kids. And generally speaking, uh, he's revealed that in his word. He has a, like a 30,000 foot view on things, okay? He sees it all. Uh, obje- he's got the objective view from the standpoint of absolute truth. We only have points of view, okay? We're out here. We, have, we see things this way. And that's why we have to bounce everything through the lens of him down on things from that 300 foot, 3,000 foot view to, to get the whole Romans 12-2 uh, view on, on life, and in our case, parenting. We have to understand, folks, that our kids, because of their postmodern indoctrination by our culture, filter reality much differently than we do. Uh, we also ha- have to understand that they've been eaten up with postmodern. They were born into it. They were... Uh, Postmodern natives, and some of us are postmodern natives, even as adults. If you were born, say, in the '60s and beyond. Um, and by the way, where does the devil do his best work? I, I tell this to our Shepherd's Hill kids all the time. Church. Now God does His best work in church too, and that's where the, the confusion comes from. So, what what is a biblical worldview? We'll get into postmodernism here in just a second. It's a worldview where all of man's presuppositions about life, truth, reality, and in our case, parenting, are filtered through the lens of Scripture. God isn't part of our life. He is our life. All right? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I think that we, sometimes Christians have a tendency to think, well, I got my agenda, my plans. God, you can come along and endorse those plans. And that's just 180 degrees uh, out of whack. Uh, as Christians, what are some of our presuppositions? Well, uh, one is God exists. That's a presupposition. That's a given. The Word is His final arbiter of truth uh, about where man came from, about why man is here, about moral right and wrong and how man should live his life on earth, and where man is going when he dies. Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Those are four issues that every human being has to deal with, like it or not, Christian or not. You have to deal with that. As Christians, we, we, we also have some pre- presuppositions, we, and we have some presuppositions about parenting, and these come from Scripture also, like the fifth commandment, which is honor your father and your mother. And it must be pretty important, because out of the ten, the first four are vertical. It's how we should deal with God, and the next six are how we should deal with man. And the very first one is honor your father and your mother. And not honoring your father and your mother, it was a capital offense in the Old Testament before the institution of civil government, so you can get stoned to death for being a, a, a rebel. Thank God for places like Shepherd's Hill, so we're keeping your kids from being stoned to death. Right? <laughs> Some other presuppositions in our Christian faith about parenting. Now, if you don't discipline your child, you don't love your child. You don't, uh, don't exasperate your kids. Don't provoke them to anger. Training our kids uh, in the way they should go. Uh, not leaving them to fend for themselves, Proverbs 29, 15. Uh, protecting them, educating them, providing them sustenance. The question is, do we really know what Scripture says explicitly and implicitly? Because it says probably more implicitly about raising kids than it does explicitly. And this is why we need to be spiritually tuned to the voice of God. This is why I said last night, the key to all this is getting to know Jesus. And we have so much lukewarm Christianity today, don't we? And I will say that, that lukewarm Christianity is probably an, an, an impediment. Uh, it's because some people would say, well, some Christianity is better than none. I'm not sure about that. I'd say it's an impediment to healthy parenting, especially in the day we live in today. And without knowing what Scripture says about parenting, it's going to be hard to parent according to a biblical worldview. Uh, even for parents who think they're parenting according to a biblical worldview. Uh, there are still things to keep in mind. Like, you know, most parents have no idea what postmodernism is uh, and, and how it affects thinking, how we filter truth. Therefore, most parents have no idea what postmodern thought has done to our kids' worldview, which not only affects Junior's thinking, but his appetites, his attitudes, his habits, his actions, his behaviors, and his addictions, and ours as well. 
Very few parents have any idea just how, how much postmodern thought has tainted their own biblical worldview and how it affects their relationship with their kids and even what they think they know or believe about God. When you look at George Barnes' statistics, you see that of evangelical born-again Christians, only 25% even claim to have a biblical worldview, and of that, 9% claim to, to live by what they say they believe. We're talking the evangelical born-agains, you know, the nut jobs like you and me. And in the teenage population, it's 2%. 2%. I was, t I was speaking at a church uh, uh, just about the subject of worldview up in Chicago, and the, and the pastor knew what I was going to be talking about, and so he went and had himself tested at a local college to see if he had a biblical worldview, and he flunked. This is the Assembly of God Church, and he, this man repented before his entire congregation. And it was just it was humbling to, to, to watch this, you know, and 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 since then, got things turned around. So, what exactly is a postmodern worldview? Well, it started, like I said, in the 60s with the hippie movement, Timothy Leary and all that stuff. Um, much of what a person with a biblical worldview believes about God and his word, the postmodern thinker believes about himself as an individual. Basically, he puts himself as God. He's the arbiter of all truth and reality. He believes he exists. He believes that he's his, his own arbiter of truth, like I said, with his own moral standards, including how to parent his kids. And this could be an abandoning them or abusing them, or teaching them fallacious things about reality and, and life, about those issues of origin, meaning, morality, and, and, and destiny. Hey, you know, you evolved from a monkey, right? You, you, you're just an animal, which public schools are teaching their kids, you know, you're an animal, just a more refined animal. And guess what? We're living up to those expectations as, as, as kids, aren't we, in, here in America today? Now, he doesn't really know why man's here on earth, this postmodern thinker. He doesn't know why, other than to pursue his own personal desires. So when you tell him that he's not supposed to be doing something, you're getting looked at as judgmental. And he knows all the judgmental verses in Scripture. Do not judge, lest you be, you know. He knows that. Takes him out of context, of course. Doesn't know where man came from, with the exception of perhaps evolution, like I said. And he has no idea what happens after death. And other than turning to dust, he really doesn't much care. Now, isn't that a foolish thing? You know, there's one guarantee in life, and that's we're all going to die. <laughs> You'd think you've got a whole lifetime to prepare for that and to not even think about it? Kind of insane to me. He has no answers to the questions of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Uh, to really complicate things, there are those people who claim to be postmodern Christians. Uh, but that's way too thorny to tackle now. We're not going to get into that. But if, you, if, you're, if you've ever heard of the, the emergent church, Okay, there you go. They raise much more uh, questions than answers. They won't plant their feet firmly on anything. And uh, it, it's a mess. I won't even get into it. The postmodern thinker would say, follow your heart. If it feels good, do it. Do your own thing. Truth is relative. What's right for you may not be right for me. I have my truth, you have yours. Truth is what you want it to be. There are no absolute truths. Now, this worldview is illogical and self-defeating, but it does rule our society, the media, particularly our entertainment industry. And our kids are eating up with this, okay? Even if they're homeschooled, they're still getting some of this uh, in, in their head. And by the way, that whole, there are no absolutes, what's wrong with that statement? See, you guys are taught well, thank you for making my job easy here. Have you ever heard this, your kids argue this? And maybe you haven't, but I know most churches I go to, they, they've argued. I should be able to do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt someone. Have you hear that one? I mean, maybe a co-worker or something? But in the very course of saying this, they've spoken an absolute. I should, I ought, I must. Those are absolute, those are imperatives. So they're contradicting their own postmodern beliefs by bringing into the equation an absolute. And this is where we as parents and, and Christians in general need to hold these postmodern thinkers accountable because that's going to be their step toward the kingdom. This has got to be their idea. This has got to be a work of the Spirit. God uses us to cultivate ground. I'm not responsible for saving anybody. 
I'm responsible for making the ground cultivated where the seed of God's Spirit can take root and bear fruit. And that's what we have to be doing. And I'm afraid that sometimes when we go like a bull in a china shop and go, Jesus, 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 then we've tr we will turn people off to that. And we get, we've, we've got to, to uh, approach them. What did Jesus do? He met them at the point of their need. He fed them. He healed them. He did things like that. And, and then we can mention where, the, where our impetus comes from. Perhaps your kids wouldn't be so bold to make a statement like, you know, like that, like, you know, I should be able to do whatever I want to do as long as it hurts someone. Maybe they wouldn't say that, but maybe they would say, that's just your opinion, Mom. That's just your opinion, Dad. You ever hear that? Again, maybe you haven't, but a lot do. Or whatever. Probably heard that one. And these are both classic responses from young people who are eaten up with postmodern thought. All logic is thrown out of the window and sacrificed on the altar of emotions and feelings. They add to their postmodern indoctrination the damage that digital technology is doing to their brain circuitry and what political correctness is doing to their ability to think outside the box for fear of ridicule from, from their peers. Now you've got a recipe for conflict with a slim chance of resolution. Because today's postmodern worldview is nothing more than really the recycling of the biblical passage that says that every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. There's nothing new about postmodernism. It's new to America in 1960, but everything recycles itself, washes itself out. And if Jesus doesn't come back and, and we don't get taken over by some rogue nation, which is very possible, um, we'll, we'll, we'll come around. I got a feeling Jesus is going to come back. But it's right here where we parents um, have to, what we call at Shepherd's Hill, pushing the antithesis. We have to push the antithesis. You know what I mean by that? It means you take their illogical statements from their postmodern thought, take their illogical statements and their arguments, and you push them to their logical conclusions. But let them come to their conclusions themselves. Don't push an answer on them. It's got to be their idea. Then they're going to own it. It'll also stick, by the way. And one of the things that I do when I'm with the kids at Shepherd's Hill is I'll ask them, I'll say, okay, what, what, what's your view on morality and how we should live life and your philosophy of life and worldview and all that stuff? And they'll say, I should be able to do whatever I want to do, as, you know, as long as it hurts someone. You get that all the time. And I'll say, okay, we'll, we'll put the weasel clause as long as it doesn't hurt someone on the side. Okay? Because they throw that one in, which is an absolute. Um, in case I want to hurt them, you know. But let's just go with, I should be able to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. I asked them, I said, well, how many people are on the planet? Seven billion. What's the logical outworking of seven billion people wanting to do what they want to do when they want to do it? And this is a very honest generation. They don't know how to blush. There's nothing that embarrasses them. And they'll say, well, chaos. And what's the logical outworking of that? War, hate, destruction, death. Yeah, you're right. Here's my worldview. Remember, I'm not bringing Jesus into the equation at this point. I said, I think I should love my neighbor as myself, and I should do unto others as I had them do unto me. Now, what's the logical outworking of seven billion people thinking that way? Well, love, peace, harmony. Uh, which world do you want to live in, Junior? And then they come to their conclusions. And then they, then they start thinking, well, you know, where, where, do you, where do these ideas come from? And then so we start exploring where these ideas come from and who these ideas came from. But they have to come to those conclusions. And when someone says there, there are no moral absolutes, and I know you've heard that from people, there are no moral absolutes, you see how that statement self-destructs before it even leaves their mouth? It's like saying, I'm the brother of an only child. You know? Or, I can't speak a word of English. It's, it's insanity. It's insanity. We also have to make sure that we're defining our terms the same way our kids are defining their terms because another byproduct of postmodern thought is the redefinition of terms 
or the deconstruction of language. We touched on that a little bit last night. So many of our kids are using godly terms with the devil's dictionary. Do you realize that? Love. Every, every contemporary song, virtually every contemporary song has the word love in it. But they don't mean sacrificial, agape, love. It's lust. It's not, nothing sacrificial about the love that our kids are getting crammed down their throat through Hollywood and Madison Avenue and in their entertainment industry. It's lust. It's selfishness. It's how you make me feel. Why do you think these, these um, Hollywood stars have you know, 15 marriages? And then, then they go on Oprah or some uh, you know, t- late night talk show. Oh, you know, they talk about the romantic interlude. This is my 15th one and I know this one's going to last, but it never does. Truth is another word. Truth is uh, relative. It's not absolute. So when you uh, talk to your kids about truth, you're thinking of absolutes, objective truth, not, not, not our kids necessarily. Now, your kids, again, like I said, may be. But out there, it's relative. If it's true to me, that's when it's true. Grace. Grace is now license. You know, we, we've, we, within the church, we, we've uh, uh, redefined that. Freedom. Freedom is no longer the freedom to do what you, you ought, which implies an absolute. It's the freedom to do what you want. And see, our, our founding fathers fought to defend our freedom to do what we ought, presupposing God in the equation. But now it's the freedom to do what you ought. Same godly term defined with the devil's dictionary. Faith, presumption. We talked about that last night. Marriage. My gosh. What, we've let this happen. Does anyone have enough sense to say marriage is between a man and a woman like H2, H2O is water, all right? H1O is not water. It's something, but it's not water, all right? You can't have dry water. We're gonna have, give me a glass of that dry water over there. Or a cold fire. Let's burn a cold fire. It's ridiculous. Family. Three men and a goat, uh, you know, six women and a pigeon. I mean, it, wh- where, where does this stuff stop? Friends. I got 300 Facebook friends. After it. You don't know what a friend is, Junior. These, ki- these people will stab you in the back. The Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You go on Facebook and everyone's saying, How, I got the biggest this, I got the best that, I got the most this. They're all lying. You know, it's, it's one big embellishment fest. And the adults are just as bad. Heroes. Ask a kid what a hero is. Well, it's a rap, rap, rap star, rock star, maybe a sports star if you're lucky. Um, and you ask a kid, well, why is he a hero? Why is this person a hero? Well, they're cool. Really cool. Cool didn't land Armstrong on the moon. Cool didn't, didn't make the guys climb those bluffs at Normandy. Cool didn't make soldiers stand shoulder to shoulder from here to that wall with muskets fighting for freedom to do what we want. You see how all these terms get messed up? And so we have to be very careful that we're defining terms the same way when we're dealing with our kids. And you've got to keep in mind your kids have no cognitive recollection beyond the Bill Clinton years. That's the only world they know. Bill Clinton was the first hippie generation parent, or president rather, and parent. <laughs> well, no, not parent. If you want to call him a parent. And this is a guy who had the audacity to look America in the eye with his postmodern thinking to a postmodern brainwashed public and says, that's that depends on what the meaning of sex is. So he's going to redefine what sex is. And so ever since Bill Clinton has been in office, kids have been having all kinds of crazy sex and redefine it. Well, that's not sex because it's not, you know, well, but it is. And it's, it's messing with their heads, and their brain chemistry, and their body chemistry just as much as full-blown sex. And then to really insult us, then we elect them twice, right? Okay. 
Because see, that's not an indictment against Bill Clinton as much as it's an indictment against the citizen, citizenry that would vote the son of a gun in twice. Okay? We get the government we deserve. He looks in the camera and he says, well, that depends on what the meaning of is is. With that bird-eating grin that he had on there. And I'm thinking, my gosh. Now, our kids know all, no other world than a postmodern thinking world. That's my whole point in saying this. Just like it pertains to digital technology, again, their natives were immigrants. I talked to a school teacher the other day who said that Adolf Hitler did what was right in his eyes. We can't say that what he did was wrong because he thought it was right. In California, school teachers, and we have California kids at Shepherd's Hill, school teachers cannot tell a kid that two plus two equals five is wrong. They have to say, well, that could be an answer, but let's explore further, Junior, because we don't want to hurt your feelings. Because postmodern thought is all about feelings. All right? We make life decisions based on feelings rather than the logic and the truth behind it. These are the times <coughs> uh, that we live in. And the other thing they can't refer to in California is they can't refer to their parents as mom and dad. Nope. You've got to refer to them as your parent. Why? Because the transgender homosexual thing going on. Political correctness, run amok. It's absolutely insane. So between the virtual world that our kids live in with all the digital technology, the postmodern thought, and the political correctness, our kids are now very good at creating their own reality. And that's really the truth. They create their own reality as they see it. They filter it through the worldview that has been they have been brainwashed with, but yet we're the ones who get accused of brainwashing our kids because we, we want to raise them uh, from the standpoint of absolute truth. Pretty nuts. And this is precisely why our kids need to be brought back to reality regularly by being allowed to experience the natural consequences of their actions and not being bailed out of everything all the time. And I'm sure you guys uh, don't do that, but man, a lot of parents, they just go to their kids' rescue all the time. They need to know that everyone is not a winner, okay? At least not all the time. And that they don't deserve the best of everything just for showing up. Because the real world doesn't work that way. It only breeds entitlement, narcissism, no sense of gratitude, and you can't be emotionally or spiritually, psychologically, relationally healthy until you're grateful for something. When you give our kids everything all the time, which is what America does now, how can they be grateful? They just expect it. We have to teach our kids to attach reward to achievement. They also need a starting point by which to, to determine moral right and wrong. And that's what you're giving them when you give them the Word of God. A starting point, a place to plant their feet. Now, you want to hear something scary? You guys remember who Chuck Colson was, right? Well, Chuck Colson, Colson did a little study, and he asked, uh, I forget how many there were, but a bunch of 18 to 25-year-olds. And he asked them, I want you to give me your greatest moral dilemma in the last five years. What do you think this generation's greatest moral dilemma in the last five years was? I, I want to raise your hand. Someone tell me. <clears throat> no. Okay. They didn't have a moral dilemma. No one had a moral dilemma in the last five years. Now, that's perfectly congruent with a biblical worldview. Because when you think that you're the arbiter of your own moral standards, there are no moral problems. The only moral problem is violating your own conscience. And if your conscience isn't shaped and, and formed and tempered by the Spirit of God, guess what? Hitler didn't violate his conscience either. And our kids don't violate theirs either when they're having buddy sex and smoking their dope and doing all the crazy stuff that they do. They're not violating their conscience. What are you on my, on my case for, Mom and Dad? Postmodernism post is also the reason our kids are so good at compartmentalizing their lives and their faith. Have you guys noticed this? They can look and act one way in one setting and then look and act just the opposite in another. They're like chameleons. 
This is a security thing. Because when you live your life under a postmodern worldview, where are you getting your security from? You are your own only security. You're going to make your own security. And, and for a kid who's 15 years old, he's 10 years removed from his frontal lobe and his brain being fully developed, he's going to find security in, in one strange form or another. But he's going to find it. It's not going to look like you think it should look like. It's not going to look like what you know God wants it to look like. And folks, trust me, I go all over the place. I know, I know what I'm talking about here. Again, may not happen here, but the same kids who are raising their hands in worship on Sunday morning are the same kids fornicating in the parking lot Sunday night. I had a guy just a few days ago call me uh, wanting to get a kid at Shepherd's Hill. He's the worship leader. He's a 16-year-old guitar phenomenon, worship leader at his church, stealing guitars, breaking into businesses, stealing uh, sound equipment and stuff like that. And yet, worship leader. That's sick. I mean, that's beyond sick. Our Bible quiz winners. Well, they're a Bible quiz winner. You know, they know Scripture inside and out. Well, guess who else knows Scripture inside and out? The devil. Same Bible quiz winners dealing drugs out of the church lobby. Seen those things too. Slandering people on Facebook. Sexting. And when I see all the proud parents of the honor students, you know, the, you've seen those honor student stickers, proud parent of honor, I just want to pull them over and say, you know, I pray that your kid genuinely is an honor student, but if you look at the statistics, 80% of kids today cheat to get their grades. 80%. And they largely use these things to do it. Again, I'm, 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 not, I'm not making an indictment. I'm not trying to indict every kid uh, as being a cheater who makes the honor roll. I'm not saying that at all. But I do think that we need to be aware that this is, th these things are going on. And this is why it's so important for us as parents not to be lukewarm in our faith. You might look strange in the eyes of your kids. Do you love them enough to look strange in, in their eyes until they're out of the house? Our kids need to be uh, see consistency in our walk and our talk. Model it. They'd rather see a sermon than, than hear one any day because our actions speak so loudly that they can't hear what we're saying. Anything less on our part makes us look like hypocrites and, 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 and our God powerless. No kid wants to submit to a powerless God. And the funny thing is that hypocrisy breeds hypocrisy. Our kids don't need to see themselves. Our kids don't see in themselves what they are so quick to see in us. Because again, I just showed you how postmodern thought is very hypocritical. It's very illogical. They don't see it. And it's largely because we're not really trained to argue it and to, and to, to, to expose it for what it is. And again, strictly uh, uh, raising my kid up with a biblical worldview isn't going to guarantee that everything's going to turn out all right. But the question is, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Is there a better option? And some people might be thinking, well, you know what, can't I, you know, uh, raise my kid up to be happy? And uh, can I be a good parent without believing in all this God and Bible stuff and without all this worldview stuff? Well, let's address that. I believe the greatest parent without God, the greatest parent without Scripture, can be infinitely greater with him. And Why? Because without Scripture, again, what standard do we use to determine what a good parent is to begin with? What standard do we use to teach our kids more right and wrong? With God, the power through prayer in the church body, we have to, to tap into infinite intelligence, power, strength, and wisdom. Isn't it a bit arrogant to, to think that we have all the answers all the time? Isn't it a bit scary to think that billions of other people will all have their answers as well? And when kids see us submit to an authority greater than ourselves, it makes it a whole lot easier for them to submit to our authority. It gives our kids a conscience monitor called the Holy Spirit. It gives us and them a greater assurance that they'll do the right thing because they'll actually know what the right thing is, especially when they're not around us. Another thing is, as parents, we don't have to bear the burden of having to be right. We can blame it on God. My daughter Allison told me, she said, Dad, one of the greatest things 
that I had go, going to school, and I sent her to a Christian school, which if I had to do it all over again, I, I wouldn't. Um, she says, well, my, my friends want to do crazy stuff. She says, I always had you to, to blame. My dad wouldn't let me do that. He's a jerk. Yeah. I'll take it. Fine. Just, just don't do that. Don't engage in that. So she's able to save a little face with her friends and had a reason why she couldn't go to that party or go to this particular uh, thing. Uh, even though God's general principles will work in general, even for the unbeliever, the unbeliever can't claim God's specific promises for eternal and earthly blessings. Another reason is because without God, we give our kids no reasonable answers to the questions of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. They're just basically our, our own ideas. We're pulling out of thin air. But not only is it important to have a biblical worldview when it comes to parenting our kids, it's also important to know just how a postmodern worldview affects our relationship with our kids and how it adversely affects our own thinking as parents. Because even in this room, it has affected us to one degree. And you're going to say, well, give me an example. And give me an example how it affects my relationship with my kids. And again, it may not affect you like a lot of places, but it, it will affect to some degree. And, and here's one way it, it affects us with, as, as far as our relationship with our kids. If truth is re really relative and not absolute, then Junior's truth is as good as yours. He feels justified in arguing his point with fervor. Who are you to tell me what to do? That's just your opinion, Mom and Dad. Another thing is, because of postmodern thought, good and evil are no longer absolutes. Who are we to say that all the sex and violence and entertainment industry is, is necessarily a bad thing? We're just being judgmental. We have no objective point of moral reference to fight against it. It's legal. Must be okay. Well, guess what else was legal? Slavery. Abortion. Now they're legalizing pot. Just like ancient Rome, folks, the state becomes our God. And if you disagree, then you're labeled an intolerant religious relic out of the Stone Age. And that's why we have to have answers to these arguments, to legitimize our faith, the way we do things in our home, and the God of the universe. And without making a big long list of things, postmodern thought has helped create a culture where what is abominable in God's eyes is now acceptable, even hip, in man's eyes. And not just any man's eyes. We're talking people of prominence and influence, our politicians, school teachers, coaches, professors, folks like Bruce Jenner and other heroes, you know, rock stars, doctors, news anchormen, talk show hosts, you know, politicians, athletes, teachers, and even preachers. As parents, we have to deal with all this as we raise our kids. Culture no longer backs us up as parents as they did when I was grow growing up. It works against us. Kids are now expected to have sex by appointment. Am I passing out or are the light's going down? <laughs> you guys know there's organizations in, co in colleges now and in some high schools, uh, the acronym is LUG, L-U-G. You ever heard of it? Lesbian until graduation. Sex sells hamburgers, automobiles, toothpaste, I mean, you name it. Toilet paper, maybe, I don't know. And why not? If it feels good, do it. Postmodern thought has given birth to political correctness. Offending someone is now the new unpardonable sin. The criminal gets more rights than, than the guy who's being violated. But this is, an all, this is all an outworking of postmodern thought, folks. And consequently, as Christians, we become peacekeepers rather than peacemakers. And I'll explain what the difference in a little bit. This makes it easy for our kids and us to be taught, believe, and perpetrate lies ourselves. And if you don't accept the politically correct notions of the day, then you're a bigot, a racist, a hater, a right-wing religious nutjob. And all this is being taught to our kids in their public schools 
their music and entertainment, their TV, the internet, on and on and on. Christians are one of the few, if not the only, socially accepted entity to be discriminated against today. Even in the mainstream media, it's okay to put us down. Maybe when they lop off enough heads over there in the Mideast, maybe the, the media will get on board with us. All this is because postmodern thought puts an emphasis on the individual's desires or the desires of the masses. Individual rights over community rights. How else does postmodern, uh, a postmodern worldview affect my relationship with my kid? Well, as parents, we no longer uh, can pull the common sense card. That's just common sense, Junior. I had a, I had a counselor at Shepherd's Hill about 10 years ago. And I said, I said, you know, that's just common sense, man. He says, you're assuming that this is common sense. And I'm like, you're right. You're right. It deconstructs language. Semantics and euphemisms rule the day. Have you noticed that? You can't say someone is uh, fat. They're cellularly challenged or whatever I mean, so, or, or whatever I mean it, 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 all kinds of that stuff w words like ought should must good bad right wrong family marriage and sin are virtually meaningless anymore certainly sin and you can say God you just can't say Jesus and these words are too absolute and exclusive for the postmodern thinker So what faith our kids still do have, they're afraid to admit, to admit it for fear of ridicule. Because most of our kids, just to be honest, aren't prepared to defend the, uh, their faith and, and the issues of logic and reason and whatnot. That's why apologetics is a must for the church today. It's an absolute must. And if things keep heading in this direction, you won't be able to say male or female anymore. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later, too. You ought to obey your parents? Postmodern thinkers it says who? While culture used to affirm Christian parents' values, now we have to fight not just our kids, but the entire culture as well. Now our culture justifies and helps accommodate our kids' sin nature. Did you know that if your 12-year-old girl tells uh, their guidance counselor in her public school, I don't know how the laws are in Florida, but in, in, I'll say most states, that guidance counselor can take your 12-year-old daughter, take her down to the local Planned Parenthood, get her an abortion, bring her back to school, and legally, you never have to know about it. And the scary thing is, is it may have happened. How are you going to know about it? It's beyond wicked. All these things are why we have to know this stuff ourselves and challenge our kids to challenge the culture and their peer groups by teaching them to push the antithesis, and expose the illogical and destructive outworking of this kind of illogic and incongru incongruent line of thought. Because it is dangerous beyond dangerous. And every church, again, ought to be teaching this stuff. In addition, and by the way, you can go to licensetheparent.org and you get a ton of resources either off our website or we'll give you resources to go to their websites to get all the stuff you need in this, in this area. So instead of sitting down and watching Modern Family, you know, Take 30 minutes and give them a, a little apologetic training. I'm going to tell you something. I was talking with Ken Ham. You guys know who Ken Ham is? And Ken, I, I said, Ken, I, I said, I'm, everyone says, well, you know, kids, uh, they, they just want more entertainment and they don't want to sit down and listen to good Bible stuff. And, and I said, that's bull hockey. I, I said, I, I, when I talk to kids about this stuff, they, they're hunger, hungry for the truth. He says, he says yes, Trace, he says, they're, they're on the edge of their seat. When you, when, you, when you talk about this stuff. They want truth. This, I have a lot of hope for this generation. They really do want truth. They're not hearing it. And, and the church doesn't know how to, 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 to teach it to them, I guess. I don't know. So in addition to challenging our kids to pray for our nation and for our church, we also have to teach them to become peacemakers rather than peacekeepers. Now, here's the difference. Peacekeeper sees me coming out of a hotel room with someone other than my wife. And the peacekeeper says, well, that's none of my business. I'm just, you know, that's a peacekeeper. 
they're basically prolonging the inevitable explosion that's bound, bound to happen. Okay, it's like a, well, we'll go that, but uh, a peacemaker says, Trace, 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 I gotta tell Beth and we gotta get this right. That's a peacemaker. That's a Proverbs 27 6 man. It's called accountability, folks. Left to ourselves, we know what we're capable of doing. I know what I'm capable of doing, left to myself. Look what King David, a man after God's own heart, look what he did. He violated every one of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time until someone held him accountable. Nathan was a peacemaker. It may have cost him his job or his head, but he was willing to be a peacemaker. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Yet he's called the Prince of Peace. Blessed are the peacekeepers, right? No. Blessed are the peacemakers. The Bible says nothing good about peacekeepers. We have to quit believing the lie that conflict is antichrist. Kids really want something to fight for. They really do. So let's be intentional to train them to rebel against the rebellion. Rebel against the rebellion. But here's the deal. And I know we only have just a few minutes left, so I'll try to rush through this. But lest you think that uh, this kind of thinking hasn't influenced you and your family more than you think, let me ask you a few questions. Where do we learn most of our moral values and parenting skills? Well, usually it's, it's our parents, right? I mean, then once we leave our parents, then it should be Scripture. And it, 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 again, in here it's probably the case, but so many Christians who have just bought into this stuff, and, I, I'll, and I'll ask them, I'll say, but was it your parents who taught you that premarital safe sex was acceptable and even wise and commendable? Your parents teach you that? That living together without being married was prudent for financial reasons? That nudity and profanity in TV and movies was just an enter entertainment art form? That anyone who slept with multiple partners wasn't a whore or a whoremonger? Call someone a whore today and see what happens. I mean, you can do it politely. Minister to them. Doesn't matter. They don't want, they don't want the label that their lifestyle identifies with. Again, another outworking of postmodern thought. Did our parents teach us that drugs should be legalized because so many kids are just doing it, it's just kind of stage they go through? Did our parents teach us that spanking a rebellious, foul-mouthed child was child abuse? That killing an unborn baby was a woman's choice? What about the kid's choice? What about the dad's choice? That our presence should be able to do you-know-what with you-know-who, you-know-where. And we should trust him for his effectiveness as a president. That music that glorifies misogyny, Satanism, violence, rebellion is just an art form. That adultery may actually spice up a marriage and lying about it is just the acceptable thing to do. Did our parents teach us that? You can go on the internet and you can, you can uh, uh, Google Frank Sinatra and you can see a, a mugshot of him. He, he was arrested in New Jersey. You know what he's arrested for? Adultery. As far as I'm concerned, it still should be illegal. Our parents teach us that sassing an adult is just a, a child's need for self-expression, or that everyone's a winner and that everyone deserves that trophy just for showing up. Our parents teach us all that. Our culture did, guarantee you that. The parents have, have to encourage sloth and mediocrity so they don't hurt Junior's little self-esteem. The tattooing, body piercing, Body modifications was, you know, just a form of self-expression. And I got two sons who got tattoos. And they think because they, you know, they, they didn't get them at home. They got them when they moved out. And they think because they're, they're Bible verses that, you know. And I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, I know it's an in-house debate. And I'm not saying it's sin or not sin. I have my own uh, convictions on it. Uh, I think uh, I heard someone say, I don't have the right to put graffiti on someone else's body. We are bought with a price. This body is not my own. 
you know, and if you got a tattoo, I'm not condemning you. You know, it's there. Might remind you of where you came from. I don't know. And, and maybe you'd get 10 of them tomorrow. You're still my brother. Or my sister. <laughs> or with today's worldview, you might be both. I don't know. <laughs> Gender fluidity is what they call it. Gender fluidity. So you can have triplets now. And you say, Yo, what are you having, boy or girl? One of each. I don't know. It's an old Rodney Dangerfield joke. Just to... Did our parents teach us that adolescence should last until junior is 30? That animals have the same rights as humans? That truth is relative in what you believe it to be, regardless of the facts? Did our parents teach us that a career woman should be more esteemed than a domestic engineer? He used to call it stay-at-home stay mom. Stay-at-home moms, you are helping create the success of our nation's future. I tip my hat to stay-at-home moms. You're brave, you're wise, and you're overworked and underpaid. Did our parents teach us that pornography is an art form and should be an elective in college? Because you can go to most colleges and pornography is a class that you can take. Yeah, so when next time you, you, know, you want to shell out all these thousands of dollars to send Junior off to college, you might want to rethink that one a little bit. And it's okay for public schools to pass out condoms to kids, but not Bibles. And it's okay for public schools to abort your daughter's baby without informing you. Like I just told you, did our, our parents teach us that? That breaking an eagle's egg is a greater crime than killing an unborn baby. That recycling is a greater faux pas than losing your virginity before marriage. Boy, you've got to peer pressure. You've got to recycle. Nothing wrong with recycling. I'm all for it. But to think that that's a greater problem than losing your virginity before marriage? Our parents didn't teach us that. That homosexuality was just an alternative lifestyle, harmless and socially and should be socially acceptable. That two people of the same gender could possibly constitute a marriage. Did our parents teach us that? That an eight year old has the, has the right to choose his own gender. Did our parents teach us that? That the public school system should make unisex bathrooms a law? Or that the police are evil? and can't be trusted. Did our parents teach us that? No, but our culture has. And your parents probably didn't teach you any of these things, but like I said, our culture has, and dare I say, in most cases, um, a lot of the church have bought, have, have bought into these things. And if the, if the adults in the churches haven't bought into these things, their kids darn sure have. So as parents, until we get very intentional with ourselves and with our kids, back to Romans 12 too, we risk being a part of America's problem rather than being part of the solution to America's problem. And we also risk suffering the same heartaches and headaches as the garden variety heathen. Why? Because when we conduct our affairs in the same foolish, sinful, and rebellious way that many Americans conduct their affairs today, then we are messing with God's ecosystem, just like they are. And there are consequences to following the wide road that leads to destruction. And there are blessings for entering through the narrow gate. Again, like I said last night, we can't live like hell and expect heaven for a reward. It's just not going to happen. And if we must impress an audience, again, let's impress and encourage our kids to impress that audience of one despite the times that we live in. You know, guys, if you're doing a re piano recital and the whole crowd's yawning because you're, you're boring them to tears, except the master who taught you. He's on his feet, and he's, he's, he's applauding to what he hears is satisfying music to his ears because you're playing his music like he taught you. There's no need to impress the rest of the crowd. So the only one that matters in life is the one who has the authority and the power to secure our eternal destiny. 
and really because of the cross he already has. It used to be easy to be a Christian in America, lukewarm as we may have been, but I think that that was actually part of our problem. And again, these are the days of God's pruning to see who really is the genuine article. And I'm not questioning anyone's salvation, okay? I'm not, even the lukewarmers, I, I, I'm not their judge, but I would like to see an assurance of my salvation. And I'm not judgmental, and neither was Jesus when he said that we're to be fruit inspectors. You'll know them by their fruit. And that implies a judgment. Not a hypocritical, self-righteous judgment, but one of assessment. And so we need to be assessing our families. How are we raising our kids? Are we allowing the world to train them in their thinking? Are we allowing the world to help them process thought the way the world processes thought? Or are we training them to process thought the way thought is supposed to be processed? Next session, I'm going to be talking more about the other parent. We're going to get into digital technology specifically. Uh, and then how to regain preeminence and authority in our kids' lives. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you.